Welcome to the SRS Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron J. Babiar, and I'm the Training Director of Support Raising Solutions. Whether you're a new ministry worker or a veteran looking to increase your competence and confidence, Support Raising Solutions seeks to bless you in your quest to be a spiritually healthy, vision-driven, fully funded Great Commission worker. My guest today is Steve Shadrach, and uh, of course, a lot of people know Steve because of his book, The God Ask, uh, which has certainly been published in the tens of thousands at a minimum, but Steve is an actual person and a friend and a mentor and and uh, just, just a wonderful person. Uh, and about a month or so ago, uh, Steve flipped the tables on me, and he interviewed me. He wanted more of the uh, the Aaron Babiar story, but, but he promised I could flip the tables back on him. And so today we're sitting down to do a little bit more of this. Steve Shadrach story. So Steve, my friend, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Aaron. Honored to be here, brother. Well, we're meeting, first of all, in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, once again, we are in your barn this time, and so we get we get a little uh, barnyard animals and rain sound sometimes, don't we? Well, it's uh, I like it out here, It's especially in the evenings. The, the stars are just fantastic out mm. here, so... Mm. Well, um, so today I want to dig into more of your story, um, and I want to hear, you know, back to back to childhood and your first steps, if you want. Maybe we don't need to go quite that far, uh, but yeah, I see. I think people would just be interested in hearing more about you. People get to know you a little bit when they read the God Ask book, but I, I think that uh, as the person who helped not only write that book, but helped launch support raising solutions and and uh boy you carried that baton really well on the boot camp for many years um but yeah let's let's take some time so you you still good to go on this let sure, us let's interview sure, you all sure. right let's go for it well first I, before we get into a little bit about your story you are a uh you're a starter you are a, a guy that gets ministries going, and and I've heard you say more than once that you like to get them going, but then you need to hand them off to people. Bro, if you leave me in charge too long, we might be in trouble. <laughs> okay, all right. So let's just start there briefly. You have helped launch multiple wonderful ministries over the years, and so give us a, just a brief grocery list. And it's okay if it takes you a couple minutes. Don't be bashful. But what are some of the ministries that God has allowed you to help get going over the years? Well, uh, probably the first one um, was student mobilization, a ministry to uh, reach out to students and winning them to Christ, discipling them in kind of the South Central United States here. Me, myself and a man named Trey Smith mm -hmm. launched that. As we left the staff, we were on staff with the University Baptist Church in Fayetteville as okay. a college pastor, but realized we wanted to really work with students. And so we started STUMO. Well, along with those Kaleo summer training programs, you know, in the early and mid 80s. And okay. Started to work in Ukraine to go along with that. Uh, a few years later, uh, we were able, along with Todd Aaron, some of our listeners probably know of Todd, we teamed up to start the traveling team. Okay. And boy, they have had an amazing ministry over the last 22 years or so, mm. traveling around the country, uh, hunt, really thousands of college campuses now after 22 years really sharing uh, uh from genesis to revelation god's heart for the nations hmm. and so it's uh, it's been an, that's been an amazing work that they have been spearheading all these years uh i then turned the leadership of stumo and traveling team and so forth over to the next generation and started the bodybuilders okay and uh that was um you know from ephesians 4 building up the body of christ but i did that with john Patton. okay and john and i are still working together now 20 years later mm -hmm. and um, and so that was just to serve the body of christ one of the uh, tools uh, excuse me one of the resource ministries that we started uh was support raising solutions okay and so starting in the year 2000, we started training other organizations, doing the boot camps, mm. uh, and that has just kind of uh, taken off over the years, yeah. um, the, the support raising component. Um, we started wanting to uh, place teams of, of mobilizers in different cities, different campuses, different countries, and we started something called Every Ethne. Mm -hmm. And it was with Andy Campman and, um, and later Bob McNabb was added to that. And okay. then they split off to form Launch Global. I'm sure some of our listeners know of that ministry. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, we want to start a resource ministry that we just called Campus Ministry Today. Mm -hmm. And a man named John Allert and I have uh, been working on that now for about 10 years, and it has really blossomed. Right. And now Paul Wooster is mm -hmm. working with me on that. And I get to kind of continue to develop that. 
helping uh, bring evangelism, disciple making, and mission mobilization to the collegiate body of Christ worldwide. And mm. so people can go to our websites and see that. In 2004, um, the U.S. Center for World Mission, Dr. Ralph Winter, asked me to come on staff as the director of mobilization. Okay. And so for eight years, uh, we kind of wore two hats. Uh, the bodybuilders, which mm -hmm. ultimately became the Center for Mission Mobilization. We, right. we did away with the name bodybuilders. People right. looked at me and they go, what, what is it? They could, <laughs> you know, what in the world? Not and, what know, they were expecting. And, huh? and, and with the advent <laughs> of the internet, you, you Google bodybuilders. Now you get some interesting stuff. Completely different intent, yeah. right? Yeah. So for eight years, uh, we, we also took on the mantle of the mobilization, which included the perspectives on the World Christian Movement course, which dramatically impacted my life in the 1980s. So we had the privilege of growing that movement in the U.S. You are a serial starter, 19 brother. other countries. Well, it's been fun. But but um, with Dave Flynn and Matt Burns were the mm -hmm. two men that really helped spearhead those things. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then finally, I might mention uh, how do we how do we you know how do we win the world to Christ? How do we do that in this yeah. whole realm of of mobilization is, is I think one of the real keys. And so how do we gather and unite and train the, the mobilizers from around the world? Right. And so this global mobilization network, mm -hmm. uh, we helped uh, launch a number of years ago and then a, a conference every other year we call GMC Global Mobilization right. Consultation. So right. um, those are some of the things that I've been involved with and, and I love to get things like you said, up and going, but really after five years, if I'm still in charge, uh, we, we might really be in trouble. <laughs> okay. And so really I, now I'm just simply the global ambassador for CMM, Center for Mission Mobilization, okay. which I really appreciate. I'm no longer the executive director, Dave right. Rothkar is. Mm -hmm. I just get to kind of be the servant of all. And I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, we definitely appreciate uh, your, your contributions to the body of Christ and and missions and the gospel of Jesus Christ. But um, now that we've heard a little more about your resume, and, and thank you, by the way, because I I don't think many people realize how God has, has used you so deftly in so many ministries and helping to get them going. But let's back up quite a bit. And yeah, tell us a little bit about Steve Shadrach as a, as a kid, as a teenager. What how did God form and shape you to bring you bring you to this point where you had such a passion for the gospel on, on a global scale? Well, I grew up in Dallas, uh, had a really great set of parents, and um, I was the middle of three boys, and we did go to church. Uh, we were church churchians, uh, but I never really embraced the gospel if I heard it until I was eighteen years old. Okay, and uh, really, I think. Um, Crew, Campus Crusade, a, a, a staff member with Athletes in Action, mm -hmm. moved to Dallas, and someone, he was just getting started with high school athletes is who he was working with, and someone gave him my name as a Christian athlete. Uh, so he started with me. Okay. And, you know, it turns out I wasn't a Christian. Uh, you weren't even an athlete. And, yeah, no, most, okay. <laughs> no, no, that's the, that's the other part of my, my standard joke, is most people thought I, uh, didn't think I was much of an athlete. I thought you were a pole so. vaulter. I ran the 40 in 5-4, not 4-5, 5-4, <laughs> okay. and I was an option quarterback. You know, okay. I could throw the ball, but now they're wanting me to run the ball, yeah. and I'm slow as molasses. Okay. No okay. wonder I did not get one single letter or call from any coach oh, at any gracious. level to destroy my great vision of playing, playing college football. Oh, you know? goodness. I'm so sorry. That was humbling. But That's it, hard on a boy from Dallas. Well, it is. That bit, football is big there. And I came from a family of athletes. And I was the, you know, I was intramural ping pong. was kind of my specialty, you know. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, it was. In fact, the death of a dream brought me to Christ. I, I was going to play college football. I had the sports car. I had the beautiful girlfriend. I had, everything was going for me. My theology was... That when everything is going for me, God must be with me. Mm. I need to reward him by walking down the aisle and getting baptized. Mm. But when everything just totally fell apart and all those things were jerked from me, well, God must not be with me. Kind of spare tire theology there. Right, you know? right, right. And so the Lord brought this man into my life at a very, very low point. I don't think I'd ever really be open to the gospel uh, unless everything had been stripped from me. Sure. And so now for the first time in my life, he actually took me out thinking I was a Christian to do evangelism in the airport. And as I was sharing this little gospel booklet with a 15 year old kid, 
it was just I was I was petrified. I was just just I was slumping down into a little mound of jelly there on the floor. It just was hmm. so traumatic. And I realized I had never received Christ in my life. Hmm. So as an 18 year old, I did that. Um, he's followed me up. He really started working with me and helping me grow. And I came to the University of Arkansas and I wasn't planning on joining a fraternity, but within a month was moving into a house for three years in the same room. And man, you talk about an unreached people group All right. yeah. that, that resides here. And so by God's grace, uh, a lot of people just kind of fade into the woodwork because of the peer pressure in those fraternity houses. But right. he just, he strengthened me and, mm. and, and gave me a cause and gave me a purpose. And especially the hellions, you know, I don't know why it is, but uh, I just, I, I, when, when these guys, they're, they're so close to the kingdom, mm-hmm. they, they know they're lost and, uh, and to win, win them to Christ, uh, they put the same zeal into following Christ as they do to, you know, the party life. Right. right. And so I think that that was really a big, big shaping time for me here in those three years in that fraternity house. Mm-hmm. I think I realized the rest of my life, I want to go to the heart of the campus. I want to go to the heart of the city. I want to go to the heart of the world to go after uh, kind of the, 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 the mainstream group who are, 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 are sinners, they know they're lost, but when they come to Christ, oh my word, hmm. they're going to have a great influence, great hmm. impact. So That's awesome. those college years were very, they shaped me all right. dramatically. They really did. That's awesome. And now in the midst of all that, I, 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 I do believe um, you, you met uh, someone pretty special. Isn't that right? Well, uh, you know, in college, I, I, as a freshman, I messed up, you know, in my dating and all. And I just said, Lord, I'm going to spend the rest of my college years just learning how to build friendship with girls. Right, right. And I'm going to focus on becoming the right person and, 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 and really preparing myself as a follower of Christ. So I didn't really date the rest of the uh my college years. Oh, so yeah, I guess I was thinking you had met, you had at least met Carol, no, but you hadn't met her no, there. No, uh, we, we happened to be, uh, we figured out there was a high school football game in Dallas where she was a twirler out on the field with the other high school while I was being chewed out by the head coach in the locker room at the halftime, <laughs> you know, I'm sure. You Probably know. not love at first sight that particular year. Uh, yeah, I didn't quite get to see her do her twirling that day. Darn. Uh, but, no, I stuck around college an extra couple of years. My dad was not too thrilled because I was involved with the Navigators by that time. Okay. They were giving me such great training. I mean, I was just soaking it in. Right. I didn't want to leave Fayetteville till I'd reproduce myself. Mm. And I had these five guys, I had led to, most of them led to Christ, now I was discipling them, but until they could really reproduce themselves, I didn't want to leave Fayetteville, right. not knowing how to multiply my life for the rest of my life. I had to do it at least once. Right. And so that, was, that also was instrumental. My dad, who was not a believer at the time, uh, really wanted me to go to seminary. Okay. And I was trying to learn how to honor my father and mother at this stage of my life. I had nearly never done that before. Hmm. And uh, so he, he encouraged me to go to seminary, and I did that. Good experience. Went to two different seminaries down the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And, and I believe you waited tables through seminary, too. I, right? I did a number of things. Okay. I, 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 any way to somehow pay my bills off, and I graduated without any debt at all. It was kind of amazing. Praise the Lord. My dad, you know, he kind of is a pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of a guy that lived through the depression. And so he, he wanted us to stand on our own. And, okay. and so I worked hard to get through. Um, but, uh, but, but that, that, that shaped me, those seminary days. Um, the summers, uh, I got to work at a great camp called Canicut Camp. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are familiar with that. I was in Branson, counselor Missouri for two area. years and then head counselor for two years and mm-hmm. worked for Joe White and Richard Beach and um, just had a, a, a lifetime of relationships that came out of that experience as well. So those are some of the early, um, you know, I, 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 the man who led me to Christ, uh, there was a, a man who discipled me uh, named Vic. You know Vic, I think, Vic Underwood. Uh, he's in, our, in our, our church up here in, in northwest Arkansas. He's a businessman. And so those, those early mentors that I had uh, really poured into me. Mm. And it just made me realize that... Um, Large groups are great, small groups are great, mm-hmm. but there's something about that one-on-one, that Paul Timothy relationship, right. that forever changed me, and I, I, I've, I'm committed to those kinds of relationships the rest of my life. Awesome, awesome. 
So take us forward a little bit in your timeline then to you're working in ministry and God's clearly using you and giving you opportunities and you're discipling some guys at U of A and then you end up down at seminary and, and uh, uh, yeah, so when, when, when did you and Carol start really yeah, intersecting? Back, back to that special girl, huh? That special girl, yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, I was at Dallas Seminary. She still claims you, by the way. Yeah, I know. Okay. I good. was at Dallas <laughs> Seminary. Don't hold that against me, please, okay? <laughs> You can t always tell a Dallas man, you just can't tell him much, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But uh, I barely graduated. They paroled me, I think. Uh, and so, uh, but I, I, you know, my final year there, uh, they want you to do a field education credit, an evangelism field education credit. Hmm. And so I had to find some church, you know, that would, you know, had some sort of program that I could get involved with and get this one hour of credit out of the way. And there was a inner city church down there that was spending Saturdays kind of pairing up people in a little group after we pray and going door to door and sharing their faith. And mm -hmm. well, lo and behold, one Saturday morning, uh, there's a girl sitting there next to me. I had a young guy I was training how to share his faith. His name okay. was Jeff Anthony. She had a young girl that she was training how to share their faith. And we, but see, I was doing it for field education credit. Right. She was doing it because she loved God. Oh, she's way more holy. Oh, but way more holy. <laughs> so somehow this pastor, you know, one, one week he, he pairs us up differently than we normally been paired up. Well, lo and behold, I'm paired up with Carol. Hmm. And now we're going door to door in you know, rough inner city area of Dallas, you know, knocking on doors. Mm -hmm. and people come out on the porch and talk to you and so forth. And I was so impressed with her, um, her clarity to share the gospel, her boldness, her sensitivity, you know. And so a, a couple of weeks later, after observing all this, I finally said, uh, Carol, uh, she worked at the seminary, by the way. Okay. I'd never met her at the seminary. It was a thousand guys and five girls. Right. And somehow you hadn't met her. And, and no, I had not. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised I hadn't been stalking her right. at this time, right? <laughs> but, uh, but no, I said, what are you doing this summer? Well, you know, what is a girl supposed to say? You know, what are you doing this summer? Right. Are you asking me out, you know? <laughs> right. And so we really was, smooth. Yeah, Steve, really, I I, my, line, my pickup lines are awesome, bro. Uh, but I had started this summer training program called Kaleo. It's a right. Greek word, means to call, summon, or invite. And the summer of 82, we were inviting students from a number of different college campuses to come to SMU, live in a fraternity house for the summer. We were going to get them all jobs at Whitewater. It was a water amusement park. Okay. But in the evenings and weekends, we're teaching them how to study the Bible and how to share their faith and how to you know, have a devotional and how to disciple someone and so forth. I still needed two girl leaders, two discipleship group leaders. Okay. And so I said, Carol, uh, what would you think about, you know, considering this particular role and, and moving in the fraternity house with us for the summer, right. she was 25 or six years old at the time. And lo and behold, she ultimately said yes. And even recruited another girl to be that other girl leader for us. Wow. And so we, I, I got to see her for 12 weeks in all kinds of circumstances, sure. early, late, you know, tired, uh, everything. But right. by the end of the summer, I said, I got to get to know this girl. Mm. And so uh, the summer of 1982? That was 1982. And by the summer of 83, we were married. Yeah. Well we done. moved right back into that same fraternity house. Did you really? But now we lived in the same room. Yeah. Instead I'm of different guess there's a little, bit of a, a little bit of a housing issue there. That's okay. right. So we, uh, we, there we were. I moved my new bride into the ATO fraternity house. You know, uh, what a romantic. Wow. I am. What a romantic. romantic. <laughs> well, praise God. So here you guys are. You're doing ministry. You're doing Cleo. And, and you've already given us a little bit of your timeline of what comes next ministry wise. Tell me, tell me about the family dynamic and the structure of, I mean, we, we've read your book. Most people listening to this have probably read your book or at least somewhat familiar with Most it. Most of it's true that I see. Most of it's <laughs> true. That's, that's a good start. That's a good start. But, uh, I mean, yeah, you guys started having kids and not just one. We did. Uh, we wanted to have double digits, and, we, and I was 28. She was almost 27. And we wanted to get started. Okay. Uh, and we had moved back up to Fayetteville here. I had been offered this position at University Baptist right. Church as the college pastor. Mm -hmm. And we lived, uh, we, we, we found this nine bedroom, four bath house. Wow. That backed up to Fraternity Row. Normally when you go house shopping, you're not supposed to buy the first house you walk into. No, especially right next to Fraternity. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, you better marry the right person that's, that's going to get excited about that. Right. And so I had read the book Dawes, the founder of the Navigators, okay. Austin Trotman, had always gotten a big house and had college students living with him or, or sailors living with him. Okay. I said, honey, what do you think about this? Well, she was all in. Hmm. So uh, 
we were able to finance this thing and, and, and move by, behind fraternity row. And so almost as, you know, within our first year of marriage, it was, we moved in this house. I don't recommend this for, for, for very many people. Right, right. But we had anywhere from four to seven students living with us each year that wow. were involved in this campus ministry to reach this campus. Wow. And so, uh, but we did. We started having kids. And uh, I don't know how this works, Aaron, but uh, we had four kids in three and a half years. Wow. When our fourth was born, our oldest was only three and a half. No <laughs> twins. So we had no problem conceiving. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. But wow, each time, amazing. she felt great during the, during the pregnancies, but each time something was happening to her body uh -huh. that each time birth, there was, there was all kinds of pains and issues mm -hmm. and struggles. Mm -hmm. And so after number four, we just said, we got to slow this train down. No mas. We got we to figure out what's happening here. Yeah. And it turned out she had a pretty serious case of uh, rheumatoid arthritis okay. that she has now lived with her whole life. Yeah. Yeah. And later, years later, we spent a year in Ukraine uh, working with college students with that STUMO, Student Mobilization Ministry. Mm -hmm. And we brought home a little bonus, a, a two-year-old girl from an orphan, orphanage there. All right. And so she's now number five. Number five. She's the caboose. Yeah. She's 26 <laughs> years old now. And she, you know, just melts your heart. A little, <laughs> little KK. Yeah. Kimberly yeah. Catherine. So that's wow. my five. And, of course, um, We've got our eighth grandchild on the way now. So we're, we're there's gracious. a lot of verses I haven't been obedient to, but that be fruitful, multiply. You got that one we're, right. We're doing okay. We're doing okay. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, just a brief sidebar here to our listeners. Perhaps you've wanted to recruit someone to your staff team, but aren't sure how to broach the topic of support raising without either scaring them away or shoving a full copy of the God Ask book into their hands. So wouldn't you like an eight-page booklet that might calm their fears and quickly unpack the basic how-tos from a practical and biblical perspective? We actually have a booklet like that. It's called The Five Keys to Support Raising, and you can get these booklets in English or in Spanish at cmmpress.org. You'll receive an additional 10% discount if you use the code SRS podcast. All right, so now you're, God's blessed your family. You've been able to raise them mostly in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, a little bit of Conway, Conway I know, was yeah. in there too. Uh, but now that now that you get to look back and, and, and on you know a lifetime really uh, of ministry, 30, 40 years at least of formal ministry. What have you learned, brother? <laughs> can you can you summarize that for the listeners in ten seconds? No, ten seconds. I'm not yeah. looking for ten seconds. But you know, you're right, right now today. How old are you? I'm sixty five. All right. So time of recording, you're sixty five, and I got to tell you, as a guy who's I'm not fifty, but I'm getting closer. Um, you know, I'm interested to hear from from people that are 10, 15, 20 years older than me. And I actually, before I came here, I was having lunch with a guy who's about 15, 20 years younger than me. He was really interested to hear some, some life, you know, some life lessons from me. So, uh, you know, you're probably, list, you're probably older than all of the listeners, Steve. So, uh, you know, tell, what, what, what have you learned about doing life and ministry? And, and it doesn't necessarily have to be specifically to support, but clearly that's what our most of our listeners, I and mean, that's, that's where they know you from. And that probably is what brought them to the podcast today. Well, I wrote this song called Don't Blink, and I gave it to Kenny Chesney to sing, you know. And <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah, occasionally on my tractor, I'm putting on, you know, in between my podcast, a little bit of country music, right? I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I think it was Kenny. <laughs> but uh, no, I did not write that song, but I can certainly relate to it because time does go so quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, Carol and I talk about that fairly often. It just, 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 just flies by. And so how do you live in the moment? Yeah. How do you build relationships? How do you build memories with, in, in ministry and with family? Um, how do you pour your life into others? Uh, I think that so many of our listeners are probably like a lot of Americans. We start off early in life thinking that if I just, um, you know, how much, uh, uh, how many degrees I can accumulate or how, how impressive my resume or how many possessions or my salary or my house or my... At some point, you realize life is not about any of that. Mm -hmm. It's about relationships. Mm -hmm. and, and really, on my deathbed, I will not be want, thinking I should have made more money or I should have bought another car or I should have started another company or something. Right. No? No, it, I, th it, I think you started enough companies. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> One more ministry. You're good, bro. Well, I'm just thinking, I think, you know, I've shared this before, but I think uh, as we're laying there, I think the two questions uh, we're going to be asking is, who did I love? 
and who loved me. Hmm. Life boils down to who did I love and who loved me. Hmm. And then I think I want our listeners to be able to turn, have a world map. I always have a world map. There's one right here next to us yep, in there, that's it. next to their table. And they can, t- they, can, they can turn their bodies over, <laughs> you know, and see that map. And by God's grace, that, that God had used them somehow, some way to touch people for Christ mm. all over that map. Yeah. And so at the end of your life, you know, you want to be able to say, I invested in eternal things. And the most eternal that we have on this earth is people, people, their souls. And that, and that you have touched the world through Christ. And so that's, that's a big part of, of, of things that, that, that I have learned, but just personally, um, you know, I, I used to have all the answers in my mind. Now all I have is questions, hmm. really and truly. Yeah. Uh, I used to think I had all these strengths. And uh, now uh, I think my greatest strength is probably that I know my weaknesses, hmm. you know. Yeah. And so um, life has a way of humbling you. Yeah. And so I was, a, you know, I go back and listen to some of the sermons that I gave as a 27, 28, 29, 30, 31 year old, you know, like this. Uh-huh. The content was good, but the attitude, man, the pride, the, hmm. the arrogance, the cutting edge, the yeah. in your face, you know. Yeah. And I think that um, you know, Jesus was full of grace and truth. There are a couple of different times he's described in the book of John. I think most of my life has been a whole lot of truth and, and a little bit of grace. And I think by his grace, I have mellowed out some. And I've got more grace in my life now. I think mm. my youngest daughter, especially KK, has helped me with that. Mm. And so, um, you know, what is, what is that balance between truth and grace in our life? And uh, so, you know, uh, those are just a few thoughts that I have. Wise um, thoughts, though. Well, you learn a lot about yourself as the years go on. Um, I lost my dad almost four years ago. And it was one of the greatest honors of my life uh, to be able to be with him uh, to transition from this life to the next. Hmm. Uh, So I've learned a lot about honoring your father and honoring your mother. My mom's still alive. We take care of her. Um, That's the only one of the Ten Commandments that that, that, that a promise is is accompanied to it, that you'll live a long, prosperous, blessed life if you'll honor your father and mother. It doesn't say just while they're alive. And so uh, that's been a big part of my life is trying to help my parents finish well uh, also. So, mm. yeah. Mm. Great stuff, man. Like, I, I think you, you kind of dumbfound me with great follow-up questions because there's the, uh, the intimacy that you're sharing there, just the depth of, of some summary of it's not, yeah, it's not about the, the degrees or what your, what your passport says as far as stamp-wise or how many, how many plane flights you've been. I know you've been on a lot. How many plane flights you have? That's... You're not putting any of that stuff over loving God and, and, and loving people. I will say this. I, I think taking that perspectives course, perspectives on the world Christian movement, being influenced by Ralph Winter and the, and the U.S. Center there uh, and, and, and the different things I've read and, and, and been taught and poured into me just about reaching the world for Christ. You know, Acts 1-8 and Matthew 28 and the different commissions were giving by Jesus himself by reaching the whole world that 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 has become that has for years now but even more so a real focus for me mm. and so how do we touch the world from Fayetteville Arkansas from Rogers Arkansas from Dallas Texas from you know wherever the, the listeners are from uh, how do we do that and uh, in the world that we live in today um, we've had the Great Commission now for over two almost 2,000 years Americans, we've been sending out foreign mission teams since 1812. And yet still there are, what, at least two and a half billion people cut off from the gospel. Yeah. What, what, how could that be with all of our technology and entrepreneurship and American, you know, enterprising and, you know. I Wait mean, a minute. American isn't synonymous with Christian? There you go. Well, that's the point <laughs> is I think we've been so ethnocentric, so egocentric yeah. that we think Acts 1-8 just applies to us. Yeah. No. Acts 1-8 applies to countries in Central and Latin America and Africa and Europe and Asia and Middle East. And, and so um, I, I've come to the conclusion that one of the ways we're going to finish world evangelization, one of the ways that we're going to really complete this Great Commission 
uh, is that we are going to serve the body of Christ in country after country after country around the world, helping them apply Acts 1-8, mm-hmm. helping them raise up missionaries, creating pipelines themselves to the unreached. Yeah. So I think one of the most strategic roles that Americans can play, we're not used to sitting in the back seat, mm. but I think that's where God, I think that's where the Lord wants us, uh, is, is that we must decrease Mm-hmm. And these other countries and the leaders and the body of Christ in those countries, mm-hmm. they must increase. It's their turn. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, we love short-term missions in America. That's on the rise. But long-term missionaries, that's been declining for years. But I'm telling you, the response that we're seeing in Latin America, the response in Africa, the response we're seeing in different parts of Asia, mm-hmm. it's literally 10 times mm-hmm. what we've seen here in the United States. God is up to something. He is. No How doubt. do we finish the job of world evangelization to complete the Great Commission? That's on my prayer list. It's on my heart. How do we do that? That's the whole purpose of our organization. And so... Um, Here's kind of boiled down. My life has all been all about seeing how many laborers we can raise up to reach the world for Christ. Mm. And the way Support Raising Solution even started is we discovered as we're raising up hundreds and hundreds of laborers that many times the greatest obstacle was how do you get them funded? Mm -hmm. Show me the money, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, that's really how SRS started was as a complement ministry to the main thrust of what we're doing around the world is trying to raise up goers and laborers and missionaries and mobilizers, but we have to figure out how to biblically and practically get them funded so they can be yeah. released to do that work. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say, um, this podcast is about you, but it's been one of the greatest honors of my life to be able to be a part of what you've done in, in, with your passion and to, to be able to be in a closed country and be a part of mobilizing someone who's going to go to places that, quite honestly, you and I could not go to without probably... Now, we're not just talking persecution. We're talking death, if you and I even tried to get there. But these brothers and sisters can go there with the love of Jesus Christ because we're thinking mobilization. We're thinking multiplication. That's right. Not just, well, I'm an American, and I'm here to help. No, no. We're, that, that, that's... Jesus doesn't need us, but he's using us still. And, well, and we think our nationality that. and our passport and the color of our skin or whatever it is, we think that's somehow better or greater than anyone on the planet. No, that's not the way God sees it. All. And there's so many countries out there, they don't want Westerners. They don't want Americans. They don't want white faces. They right. don't want, you know. I'm just saying that uh, if, if, if we can go into South America and realize, help, help the body of Christ there to see how many laborers we can help them raise up. Yeah. The Arabs love the Latins. Sociologically, the Latins and the Arabs, they, they like each other. They connect they're, they're, very the, well. The similarities, the language, the skin color, the culture, the, they, they vacation, they intermarry. They, well, right now in our history, come on, Americans, we're not going to be the ones to win the Arabs in the Middle East. There's not that much love lost right now. No. But the, but the, but the Latins? Mm-hmm. And you know what, Aaron? When one of those missionaries goes, they go, they buy one-way tickets and they go and stay and serve and suffer and persevere at one-tenth of the cost yeah. of us, All right. you know, Americans who need the big house and the comforts and the conveniences and yeah. the cars and, you know, and, and if we stay past a year, we're some kind of hero. <laughs> but by that, the way, I know your heart here, but I just want to say something for clarifying. We're not undermining Americans who no, are missionaries. No. They very much have a yes, role. We yes. still do need to send of out course. more Americans. Yes, that's but, a different conversation. Yes, I apologize but, for but I, implying that. No, I, I don't think that's what you're implying. I didn't want anybody to take yeah. that out because yeah. we, we still do need to send Americans. We desperately but need them, yeah. part of a, a great global strategy that's to mobilize people yes. who aren't Americans yes. to be to be missionaries, not just to have missionaries go to them, but to to mobilize them to the, so that they can also go out, so they can go to places that we can't go as Americans. It's a way to serve them uh, and 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 encourage them um, and and help them to fulfill what is on their heart. They want to reach the world for Christ, Amen. and I just think it, it is one of along with, with goers right now from our country, missionaries, yes, from our country, but, but, but helping mobilize the body of Christ in other countries, mm-hmm. as you can tell, that's, that's kind of the heart and soul of the CMM, the organization I'm part of. But right. 
it is, I think, at least in this day and age, one of the most strategic uh, roles yeah. that, that Americans can play. Yeah. So um, we're almost done. Okay. I'm going to throw a curveball at you here. Yeah. What's next for you? I mean, you're, you're, you're aging well, my friend. You well, know, I, I, I need to shave and, <laughs> and um, you know. Got the COVID haircut going on a little know, bit, I, I can I, see. I need to visit my barber. <laughs> I'm just glad this is audio and not video, right? <laughs> well, well, listen, uh, well, let's, we're say about to start. You, let's say God gives you another 10 to 20 years of great mental, physical health and clarity. What, 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 what's in front of you? I know you, I, I'm not saying you have the gift of prophecy here, but... What do you imagine? What do you imagine might be what God has next for you? Well, um, maybe the presidency. Maybe I can run for president. <laughs> no, no, no. Just kidding. Uh, yeah. I, I've always felt like that a spirit-filled Christian could ultimately have more impact than, you know, a U.S. senator. You know, that it's regeneration mm. that impacts the world more than legislation. Right, you know? right. So I'm kidding about that. But... Um, <clears throat> You know, um, I've, I've asked my supporters uh, for 10 more years. Just give okay. me 10 more. But I have a feeling in 10 years from now, um, I'm going to go, hey, listen, it's 10 more just 10 more years. <laughs> <laughs> I can't find retirement in the Bible anyplace. I mean, I, I've looked. There's one place in the Old Testament where the 50-year-old priests are supposed to turn their duties over to the 20-year-old priests. Hmm. Outside of that, I think it's kind of a kind of a, a lie that Merrill Lynch and these groups have kind of foisted upon us to get us a cent of money every, every month, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, again, I'm not, if someone feels like they want to retire, that's great. And I, you're not think, saying don't have savings. Don't know. I'm not, I have savings. I have 401k. I mean, all those things are good. Let go and let God. No, no, no. You actually need to have a good budget plan. Yeah. But I'm just saying that I think retirement's not as all, it's, it's not all it's cracked up to be. All right. You better have a great plan of how you're going to spend your latter years, mm-hmm. or they can be empty. They, they can be they're not not very meaningful. And so I want to, um, and, and and so one thing that I my leadership and organization is kind of turning me loose to do right now is writing. I'm, I'm doing. I'm, I'm just completing a book right now that, uh, and we're about to start on another one. Um, I'm about to start a podcast. It's going to be an audio and video. It's just going to be called Campus Ministry Today. Great. Paul Wooster and I um, are going to be doing that together. Uh, we're creating uh, uh, training modules that in the area of support raising and campus ministry and leadership and mission mobilization that we are going to use to serve ministries all over the world um, to come to their part of the world and for them to gather their constituency together and train them in some of these areas. So it's a to really be a part of resourcing. I'm a global ambassador, and so I get to. I get to. We're in 20 countries. The CMM is, but uh, so many of our partner ministries are in those countries, and many more. And so, I'd like to spend the rest of my life uh, kind of serving and building up the body of Christ mm. in some of those areas and topics that I've kind of been focused on, yeah. um, along with the writing. I, I do enjoy some of the freedom and flexibility uh, to spend time with grandkids. Well, now that you're not the president of CMM anymore, right. you don't have to answer the phone all the time. Not at all. <laughs> and I, you know, it's interesting. Some of our listeners probably are getting getting on up in the years, and uh, I really don't want to lead or manage anymore. Hmm. I, I want to turn that over to other men, younger men. All I want to do is serve, hmm. and and that, that takes the pressure off. You kind of turn that organizational chart upside down. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and really, if you're doing something that someone else could do, you're robbing them. Hmm. You're robbing them of an opportunity to grow and develop. And so I want to get to a point, I know I want our listeners to think about this. It's, it's, it's the concept of finding your sweet spot, bringing convergence into your life. Get to the point where you're doing what only you can do. Hmm. And you've given away all other responsibilities and opportunities and duties right get to a point where you're doing what only you can do hmm. and there's some real uh, there's some real power to that a sense yeah. of destiny to that too yeah yeah well steve i, I appreciate and i'm sure our listeners will as well appreciate uh, just your, your frankness and your honesty and and uh, uh, you have a beautiful wife and family, and uh, you. even your barn. You know, I'm not really a farm guy. I don't listen to country music, but I, I can appreciate you. I can appreciate. <laughs> I can appreciate your your land. But uh, brother, uh, thank you. 
Thank you, brother. From the bottom of my heart, from me, thank you. Thank you for your investment in, in me and and other and other people that have a passion for the Great Commission, and uh, and thank you for the God ask, and thank you for for not quitting. God still has given you some breath. I got a few years left. And uh, God, yeah, God willing, you you do. God well, and Aaron, you, you you have been one of the men that has taken the baton of something that yeah, I may have gotten started and created. But when you came along, you were a godsend, brother. And the more I got to know you, the more I realized who you were and your strengths and your character and your spiritual gifts and vision and, and uh, your history and life and family and all the things about you. I realized, man, here's the guy that mm -hmm. can take this initial vision of sport raising solutions, especially the, all the training components there. And you can take it and grow it and multiply it and develop it. And you have just, you, you, I sleep really good at night mm -hmm. knowing you're in charge, brother. So well, thank it's, you. It's, it's my honor. And, uh, and I don't want to take, I really don't want to take much credit there. You, you, you and a team of people did a lot getting it going. And, uh, Mark Wilson and, and, uh, Sue Osborne and Jessica Wood and, Callie Buchholz, they're they're uh, they do more work than I do. Yep, and, and, and your partner Micah May, <laughs> Micah May, and Jeremy, and Jeremy Henderson. Yep, yeah, you've got quite a team, and I quite a team. I, uh, you know, they oh. they occasionally, you guys occasionally check in with me and act like I'm, you know, still still part of the team. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, you got us started. Yeah, and uh, we, we 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 thank you, and uh, and brother, thank you for sharing on the podcast today. It's, it's been an honor to have you thank once you, again. Sir. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode. We would love to hear your ideas for future content. Please visit supportraisingsolutions.org slash feedback to share your thoughts and questions. Also, wherever you download your podcast from, be sure to subscribe for future episodes and come back each week to gain more insight into the process of building and maintaining your personal support team.